I'm Mark Edwards. Welcome to Travelog and welcome to our Taiwan series. I finally managed to rip myself away from the wonderful grasp that Taipei had on me. And in this episode, we're going to try and bring it down just a little bit. As you know, some of the major cities can sometimes be a little bit too hectic, a little bit too many people. So we are going to jump to the exact opposite end of the scale. I've hopped onto the old Pingxi railway line and to one of the older trains that takes in a lot of the smaller villages around Taipei and beyond. So hopefully, we're going to get to be a lot more relaxed and a lot more laid back. So get comfortable. In Taiwan, it's possible to cover the whole island by train, which is a fantastic way of getting to see the natural scenery. This is one of the oldest and most famous railways in Taiwan. We start our journey from Jin Tong, where the station was built in 1930, entirely of wood. The Pingxi Railway, originally built to carry coal to Keelung, is a highly scenic 12-kilometer ride. Its narrow-gauge tracks ferry nostalgic tourists and escapist city folk looking for some peace and tranquility. Next stop, the village that lends its name to the railway, Pingxi. A mass migration of the younger generations to the cities has left villages like Pingxi populated by the very young and the not quite so young, which means the pace of life is unhurried. So I've hopped off the train at Pingxi and I'm in the centre of the little town. One of the things I love about that railway line is you can really get on and off the train at all the li different little villages and you feel so far away from the sprawling city of Taipei. I'm right here and I'm experiencing the local culture, they're, they're traditional, like what they do just in everyday life and it's, it's so quiet, there's very very few people, there's just two main roads, this one here and this one there and I'm going to go there and have a look. With its semi-deserted streets, Pingxi is refreshingly quiet. It's not difficult to find your bearings here, since there are just those two main streets. The lifestyle is traditional, and the shops reflect this. Pingxi is the only township in Taiwan not to have a single major supermarket. Hence the presence of such a variety of local shops. Ancient trinkets, old farming tools and handmade cloth make you feel like you've travelled back in time half a century. The reason the train is so packed now is that the next stop is without a doubt one of the more popular ones on the line. It's the village of Shufun, which is famous for something quite special. But more of that in due course. Pop your head into the local control centre, manned by the friendly train people, and you'll get quite a surprise. It's as if nothing has changed for decades. I guess the railway and the village are pretty well everything a train enthusiast could dream of. So I've arrived at Shifun train station, and uh, here is the Shifun train station sort of gift shop. And I've been told that the thing to do is to grab one of these, which is uh, an old school ticket, uh, and it's also a postcard. And to explain, Shifun means 10 minutes or very. And uh, here we've got the character Shinfu, which means happiness. So you're basically sending a ticket to someone's happiness. Do you get where I'm going with this? So you send this uh, to one of your friends as an auspicious wish to wish them good luck and uh, happiness. If you decide to spend a day taking in the villages around Taipei, let me give you one piece of advice. Throw away your itineraries, timetables and anything else designed to keep you to a schedule. Just take it easy, send off a postcard or two or just buy a few souvenirs. Here. It's all about doing things at your own pace. The villages are small, tiny in some cases, but that just adds to the charm. Shifun is slightly more upmarket than some of the other villages, so it might be a good choice to spend the night if you want your village hopping to last more than just a day. And why not? Simply take your time strolling around, enjoying what is in more ways than one, a timeless experience.
So uh, I'm in the middle of the railway tracks at uh, Schiffen train station and this, this, the tracks came first and then the town was built around. So uh, to the locals it's very much part of their life where it brings customers to the shops that are on both sides. It's not the safest thing if I'm going to be honest but uh, you know, everyone each to their own. Whether there are tourists around or not, life in Schiffen continues to follow its very languid course. That said, it's probably a good idea to avoid the weekends because the crowds may spoil your enjoyment of the calm and tranquility. Don't worry though, there are plenty of modern hostels, cafes and restaurants here. And so on to Schiffen's chief attraction, lanterns. Whether you're here during the festival in late January or February or not, you'll find that this place lives and breathes lanterns. The entrance of the cafe I'm chilling out in is shaped like a lantern, as are the carriage doors on the train that brings you here, and even the windows. In fact, everywhere you go in Schiffen, you'll see reminders of its most important product. There may be commercial benefits, but above all, it's a tradition. As the owner of this quaint little shop explains to me, he's been making lanterns since he was a boy. To him, Making and then flying the lanterns is the way people here send good wishes to the world. Here in Pingxi, the story goes that a long time ago, the village was always plagued with bandits at this time of year. So the villagers would retreat to the valleys, leaving only the strongest men folk behind. They would release lanterns into the air when the coast was clear. And that's how releasing lanterns has come to symbolize a wish for security and peace. These days in Pingxi, it's not just the strong men who release the lanterns. Everyone has a go. You get the most fun by doing it as a couple or as a team. Put those good wishes down We'll get those secrets off your chest and then stand back and wait for them to come true. Or at the very least, watch them float away in the air and wonder who may end up reading them. So we're getting all of the lanterns lit right now. Normally speaking, it's on the 15th of January that the lanterns are lit, but we don't let little things get us down. Let's not get bogged down. Let's get all of the lanterns up. I've even got a little shout to the little one. Ready? Go! The whole train route is picturesque, but you get the scenic beauty full frontal when you head to Jingua She. Nestling in a small valley, Jingua She is surrounded by mountains, flowing rivers, and a majestic view over the sea. Oh, and then there's one more attraction, gold. The Gold Ecological Park is a mixture of museums and mine buildings, most of them dating from the early 20th century, although the majority have been restored. There's something here called the Benchen Fifth Tunnel Experience. It's a 180 metre section of renovated mine, and it's an experience all right. Dark, dank, and with a hint of intrigue. The tunnel network extends for more than 600 kilometers, and in parts, it descends down as far as 132 meters below sea level. Wow, well, uh, don't know if it's uh, just me. I, I actually love little places like this. I find them, I don't feel claustrophobic, but I don't have to come down here every day like the people mining used to have to. This is the fifth tunnel of nine and the ninth one used to actually go under the sea to go and look, all of them looking for gold. Um, this is fine for me for 10 minutes, quite enjoyable, but whole lifetime, I don't know. If you happen to come on your own, never fear. 
you won't be lacking in company. There are wax exhibits inside, with speakers recreating the banter of old. Do bring a jumper though, as it can get pretty nippy down there. Beyond the bench and tunnel, and an almighty contrast to the blackness of the mines, is the Gold Museum, giving you a well-illustrated introduction to the history of mining in the area, including a description of gold extraction techniques. So if you're strapped for cash, just watch the documentary and take some notes. Well, I don't know why I bothered hunting for gold down in the mines when it's been up here all the time. This is said to be the largest man-made gold brick in the world and it's worth over five million dollars. I'm touching five million dollars right now. Come and give me a hand, come on. A quick ten minute drive to the other side of the mountain with the ocean keeping you company, you come to Jewel Fern literally meaning nine parts. It began life as a gold rush town and is now an arts and crafts mountain retreat. At the turn of the 20th century, just nine families lived up in these hills, hence its name, which is a reference to provisions being divided into nine parts for these people. We're on the uh, old street in Jilfen, Laogier. Lots of small snacks, check them out. Give us some more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, Today, the main attraction in Jufun is its narrow streets lined with tea houses, souvenir shops, and places to grab a well earned snack after the trek up the hill. In the old street, you can mingle with the local people whilst trying out the traditional local grub. Apart from filling your stomachs, another imperative is to find a vantage point overlooking the sea. The views are simply stunning. So it's no wonder Jiu Fun has become a popular movie location. The 1989 film City of Sadness, which was set here during the Japanese occupation, brought a flood of travellers out to the old village. They were in search of a way of life that had all but been swept away in the charge to modernization. In this restaurant, the owner's parents made mining tools during the gold rush. Now, the children are making their money from the tourist rush. So I sweated my way to the top at Jilfen and I finally managed to come to a nice coffee house where we're overlooking the sea behind me and I'm catching some sun. It's a perfect place for half a day to have some manly cocktails and work up your tan. Cheers. In the 1930s, Jilfen was so prosperous that it was known as Little Shanghai. However, in the 70s, after the gold mining stopped, so did tourism, until some artists arrived sparking a resurgence in Jufen's fortunes. Cheap, with stunning views, the artist's advert almost writes itself. With the artist's arrival, Jufen's shops underwent a significant change. Handicrafts and real works of art began taking the place of the typical tacky souvenirs that you can find in so many similar places. Here you find intricate craftworks embracing innovative ideas. It's definitely a sense that you can pick up some unique souvenirs around here and a bargain basement prices to boot. Among the artists who have made Zhu Fen their home is Chu Xi Dong. He's one of the most famous painters in Taiwan, although his name is chiefly associated with a little known art form. Asphalt isn't something you'd normally think of as an alternative to paint, but try telling that to Chu. It all started one day when he noticed how a newly tarred road glistened in the natural sunlight. Being an artist, he naturally wondered how asphalt would perform as a medium of expression. With asphalt being cheap and readily available in Jufen, due to most of the roofs there being made of the stuff, it proved to be a brilliant move. You really need to see it firsthand so you can experience the skill of every movement. Who would have thought that asphalt could be used to create such a vivid portrait? Oh, I mean, you've probably seen asphalt used uh, for, for floor on the floor or used 
for roofs, but uh, I'll tell you what, I have never seen it used to paint a picture like this. That is so impressive. Um, yeah, I'm blown away. Next stop is about an hour's drive from Taipei heading southwest. It's a town called Yingge. And if Pink Xi is all about lanterns, then this place is all about something quite different. So I popped on down to Yingge, which I'm told is the ceramics capital of Taiwan. And what better place to start than at the Yingge Ceramics Museum? Yingge means singing parrot in Chinese. The name's thought to refer to the bird-shaped rock at the town center. But the town is best known today as Taiwan's premier ceramics manufacturing center. The Ceramics Museum tells you everything you'll ever want to know about Yingge's history and about ceramics in general. So I feel quite lucky that my visit to the Yingge Ceramics Museum happens to have coincided with a very special exhibition called the Creativity Awards. Now, that seems to be a recurring theme in a lot of the places I've visited so far in Taiwan. In this instance, the ceramics are highlighting a lot of the environmental issues that we're facing today. So it's a feast for the eyes and gets the old brain working a little bit. It's not just pots and pans at the museum. This stylish building and its contents present you with a real cerebral challenge. Here, ceramics are an art form that make you think. It's definitely modern and it's definitely creative. But don't overheat your brain trying to work out what everything is. You're much better off just letting yourself be blown away by the craftsmanship. Shops line the pedestrian-only old pottery street, selling everything from simple earthenware to the finest porcelain, from ordinary teapots to delicate figurines. Well, when you're in Yinga, you can do your very own, hold on, let me get this on straight, you can do your very own pottery. And uh, firstly, I'd like to warn you that I am shockingly bad at anything that involves art whatsoever, but I shall embarrass myself for your enjoyment. Ni hao. Yinge really is a pottery lover's paradise. Some of the factories offer tours which give you the opportunity to witness how muddy clay is transformed into a beautifully painted Chinese vase that wouldn't have looked out of place at the Ming or Qing court. There's also a chance to have a go yourself. No doubt the result would look out of place at court, but that can't take away from your sense of fulfillment. The teachers here are all volunteers who do this as a hobby. My modern-day Picasso is, funnily enough, a senior manager with a large American corporation. This factory-come-workshop has over 80 years of history, and the owner very kindly shows me how porcelain used to be made. Many of the same techniques are still in use today. It all started when the hacker people arrived here in 1684, and they began planting tea. But with the discovery of the fine clay in the surrounding mountains, Yingge was changed forever. Yingge was actually the first place in Taiwan where ceramics were produced. Around 200 years ago, this tiny town was the biggest exporter of ceramics on the whole island. Almost all the shops here started out as kilns. You can still see some of the old chimneys standing proud, though they're no longer in use. Around 200 kilometers southwest of Taipei, you'll find Lugan. And we head straight to the Longshan Temple for some culture. It's one of the most famous and also one of the oldest Buddhist temples in Taiwan. It's noted in particular for its exquisite wood carvings. So I've had a brief explanation of how these temples in Lugang came to be. And back in the day, early Chinese settlers coming from the mainland would bring lots of different gods with them across the choppy waters to give them safe passage 
down to the island. Now, when they landed, they would build these temples as a way of thanking their gods for this. And in this particular case, we're at the Longshan Temple, the Dragon Mountain Temple, which was built 300 years ago, dedicated to Guan Yin, the goddess of mercy. But there are several temples in Lugang, and some of which are actually side by side. It has recently undergone a major restoration, but we're assured that the work placed specific importance on keeping the original appearance. The Chinese opera stage in the temple complex has the oldest surviving octagonal caissons in all of Taiwan. They generate an effect of resonance that enhances the opera experience. This temple is a replica of its namesake in the town of Anhai in Fujian province, where some of the earliest settlers in Lugang came from. There are many more Longshan temples in Taiwan, but this is one of the most well known. I'm just enjoying a stroll down the oldest street in the whole of Lugang. And uh, it really is very relaxing just looking around at some of these shops. And I've had a look inside and they actually still stock some of the old uh, brands that have been around for a long time. But this is the street where the whole town developed from. Lugang means deer harbour, an allusion to the herds of deer that once roamed the nearby plains. This ancient inland port lies sleepily near the shore of the Taiwan Straits. Back at the time of the Qing Dynasty, it was a major port of entry for the waves of immigrants making their way from Chuanzhou in Fujian province. Lugang is particularly interesting because it offers a rare glimpse of old Taiwan. Despite the town being noticeably modern, many of the narrow residential lanes have changed little since the Qing Dynasty days. It's an excellent place to pick up traditional handicrafts, such as wood carvings. The buildings may have become more modern, but the traditional way of life continues in Lugang. You can quite literally get a taste of how things used to be. So uh, speaking of old brands, I've just been uh, explained that this was in fact the equivalent of uh, old school energy drinks. So this would bring the people, the, coo the coolies who were bringing uh, all of the goods off from the ships, uh, energy as well as, well, instead of water, I suppose. Mm. I feel energized and, uh, oh, nice taste. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite nice tasting as well. We've only been here for one day, but still we've managed to get a sense of the popular lifestyle here and of how the past lives on in so many ways. If I were you though, I'd definitely spend longer in Lugang. Unfortunately, this is the part of the episode which I normally cannot stand. However, uh, it's with a slightly more bittersweet feeling that I'm approaching this one because we've still got so much of Taiwan to discover in the rest of the series. I hope you've enjoyed the last half an hour and I'll focus on a somewhat more leisurely aspect of Taiwan where some of the old towns and the old villages really highlight the difference between the hustle and bustle lifestyle that you can sometimes find in the major cities. Must stress though that those old towns really were hand-picked and there are many, many more in Taiwan for you to discover where tradition, culture and this slow pace still remain. I'm Mark Edwards and I'll catch you very soon on another episode of Travelogue.